Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and the presentation you're about to see is the one that I had pre-recorded uh, for showing on Nantucket uh, in March. This presentation is all about elder law when you're in your 70s. This is transition time. This is the time when you're trying to figure out whether if you can, if you want to stay home, what, what the adaptations you need to make in order to just stay in your home the way it is, or maybe you want to downsize, or maybe a relative is coming to move in with you, or you're moving in with them. There, or And maybe at this point, in the back of your mind, you're saying, ooh, are our, are our assets safe if, if some of, somebody needs nursing home care here? These are all the issues that you really start thinking about when you're in your 70s, and the, the seminar is meant to address all those. So uh, I hope you hope you enjoy that presentation. With me is my good friend, Laura Stewart, because it's March. There's always stuff happening at the Salt Marsh, but what, go, what is going on in March, uh, Laura? So what is going on are normal things. We have our all of our fitness classes in the morning, our congregate lunch Monday through Friday. We have afternoon games. We are also doing a lot with Nantucket Shipwreck, Shrip, Shipwreck and Life Museum. Uh, they're coming here to do presentations. They're taking tours around Nantucket to specific places. They are also doing a movie night once a month and they will send their van down to the salt marsh, pick people up and bring them out at four o'clock in the afternoon and bring them back so they don't have to drive at night, which is fabulous. We are continuing our um, uh, museum on the road with uh, the historical museum. Today they are doing the Great Fire of 1846, so that'll be good. Uh, the other basic things that we do all the time, we have our cooking, we have our shine, um, counseling, social security, and we also have legal advice with Arthur. So lots going on, very busy. Constantly busy and also just a fun place to go. So, you know, if you haven't been, if you know, if you're the regular, then you know what it, how good it is. If you haven't been and you think that the people there are just too old for you, well, you know, get over it and go right. to the salt marsh. You know, exactly. it's a good time. There's a lot of people, chances are somebody that you know is gonna be there, right? Very true. And, and just 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 to find out what's going on. So so Laura, if they want to reach you, what's the best number to reach you? The best number is 508-228-4490 or come down to the Salt Marsh on 81 Washington Street and check us out and come and say hello. And check us out, check them out. And if you got any questions on the seminar, give me a call, 508-860-1470. Thank you and happy spring. Thank you, Laura. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Art Bergeron, and uh, welcome to this, the third of 12 sessions, which I'm calling Elder Law 101. Everything you need to know about elder law from the time that you're under 60 to, the, to after you've died. Uh, this is the third session uh, dealing with your 70s. Uh, my median client age is 74. Many, many people come to see me in their 70s. I'm actually 73 myself, so I can totally identify with all these issues. So just to give you, once again, just for a quick review, we're doing 12 sessions. This is the third one. We've already talked about incapacity before you were 60. Then what things to consider in your 60s. This is about the 70s. Next month, we're gonna um, uh, step over to a different topic. We're gonna talk about taxes because it's April. Uh, and then we're gonna go back to life in your 80s, um, why you can always qualify for mass health, the, what, what, you know, about the last year before you die what to do after you die, who, who needs to do what, uh, um, how to deal with trust. We deal, we deal with a number of issues. So for today, we're talking about life in your 70s, dealing with your 70s. First, we're gonna talk about planning to stay home. This is kind of the big issue for so many people and it's the issue that when you're in your 70s, um, if you wanna stay home and that's your goal, if you're like my friends Frank and Mary, who have kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., and whose goal in life is to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard. The 70s is where uh, that goal uh, needs to be examined uh, and re-examined. By the way, that same goal, I'm assuming, is true if you're Mary's sister, uh, uh, Peg, or her daughter, Peggy. Uh, if, even if, if you're single, you're thinking out the same thing, and all of the issues that I'm talking about today are going to apply whether you're married or single. So the first question, if you really want to stay home, is how do you make sure that the home is going to be continued to be safe? There are things that just need to be taken care of about the home. Um, and then you want to make sure that that home 
is meant to, is to, is going to be safe for you even if you're getting older um, where the, the issues might change where your risks of falling your the, the risks that are around the house are going to change not because the house is changing because, but because you're changing so the question is do you need to modify that house just in case you become incapacitated and if you're planning to stay home for the rest of your life uh, do you want to make sure that you have the resources to get the care that you might need in order to do that, in order to be able to stay home? So we're going to talk about all of those issues. Um, based the, ba the core about this plan that you need to develop is hope is not a plan. I talk to seniors all the time who are saying, well, you know, I'm just going to kind of hope for the best. Well, you know, that's kind of okay, but it's really kind of not going to prepare you for the way that your life might play out. So it's really, really important to try to get a more, um, to really think this out, to think this out. So to be able to figure out that plan, you first of all need to be able to figure out kind of what are your, what are your resources. So I'm using two examples. Um, uh, as many of you know, I do a lot of work um, in the Metro West area where I live. Uh, in, I live here in Marlboro, uh, which is where I'm filming actually, and I also do a lot of work on the islands. Um, Frank and Mary are in both of these scenarios have, have assets that are basically the same except for their house. Um, Frank has an IRA worth about $400,000. They've got joint savings worth about $300,000. The difference, of course, is uh, around here, that means they've got total assets of about a million one because their house worth about $400,000. On the islands, that means they've got assets of about a million seven because their house is worth a million dollars. So that may you know, uh, you know, affect your thinking on this, but the point is you need to know what your resources are. And in this case, I'm assuming that Frank's income is uh, 2,000 a month from Social Security, Mary's is half of his, 1,000 a month in Social Security. So in that situation, the question is, how do you plan to get to the goals that he's trying to achieve? How do you plan to make sure that your house is going to be safe, your house is going to be affordable, and that you can have the funds available for the home care that you might need. Um, first, where do you get some of that advice? Well, the senior center, your senior center, is typically a great place to start. They can talk to you about what resources there are to help you figure this out. Uh, a second one is the, the uh, Aging Services Access Point, uh, which in our area had, had traditionally been called Bay Path Elder Services. They are now called Springwell. Bay Path has merged into Springwell. Uh, on the islands, it's, it's Elder Services of Cape Cod on the islands. Finally, there are geriatric care managers, folks who have really decided that they want it to be their business to help people like you figure all of this out, both figure out how to plan for your needs as you get older, and then actually figuring out how to deal with that. Uh, I'm, going to be, uh, I'm going to actually do a separate presentation. Uh, each, for each month, month that I do a presentation like this, I'm doing a series of shorter clips called Bergeron Briefs. One of those clips, they're 15 minute, uh, 15 minute presentations, is going to be an interview with a geriatric care manager so that you can get a better understanding of what those folks may be able to do for you. Um, so one of the questions, as I mentioned, is you want to make sure that the house is safe that it's safe kind of in general, that you know, the roof's not leaking, that the heating is still working, uh, and, and, uh, yeah, and probably all of those things are working for you right now, but the question is, if you're planning on staying into your, in, for your, in your house now, in your, through your 70s, from this point on, Frank and Mary's income is pretty much frozen. They've got the assets they've got, so you need to make sure that you've got the resources if the house needs it to do something. Then, you need to figure out how that house, which has always worked for you as a younger person, may need to change and how you may need and what new things you may need for that house uh, as you get older. Things like, uh, you know, the classic chair lift. Everybody knows what chair lifts look like. Many people haven't thought, though, about a, a t an alternative that was impossible or unlikely uh, when I started doing this kind of work about 15 years ago but it has become relatively inexpensive now. Uh, that is in actually installing a home elevator. Uh, for a lot of folks who have a two-story house, one of the issues as you get older is the second floor of the house becomes increasingly hazardous, just getting there and getting back again. 
um, an elevator may be a, a, a great choice for you and the most convenient and actually an affordable choice. Then there are issues about trying to improve the lighting, trying to maybe adapt the appliances that are in the, in the, uh, in the, in the kitchen, doing a number of other home improvements that really might improve the safety of your location. Once again, you may want to have someone come in who is a professional, like a geriatric care manager, who can, among other things, look at your house and, and recommend some things that you, that you might want to consider. Um, for those of you who are still basically healthy, and, and you don't, so you don't know what kinds of changes you might need because you don't need what kinds of problems you're going to face, the main thing is to have enough money uh, uh, in reserve so that whatever the problem is, you can figure it out. So what you need to do is kind of figure, do, do some estimated costs for that elevator or that chairlift or, or for grab bars or for getting a ramp or for the larger things, fixing the roof, having the furnace replaced, having the hot water replaced. Add them all up. In this case, if you added all of that up, it adds up to about $100,000 and say to yourself, okay, so that's how much I, not necessarily how much I need to do right now on my house, but how much I need to have available in case it needs to be done later on. Then try figuring out, or estimating at least, what might be the cost of your home care in the event that you, your capacity to get around the house and to do some things like cooking uh, um, or, or, or uh, taking a shower by yourself, or a number of different things, to, to the extent that your capacity to do those things has gone down, do you have the reserves to take care of that? Um, and, and now, the, once, once again, many times when I talk to folks, they'll say, well, I'm not worried about that. I've got kids and they're around here. They're gonna take care of this. Well, maybe, um, and it's, I'm not, but hope is not a plan. And I'm not saying that your kids wouldn't want to help, all I'm saying is, and trust me, I've had a lot of experience with this, many kids who want to help run out of gas. They just, you, you, you're, you're helping, but you know, your children, many of them, have their own lives. They have, they have children, they have jobs, they have all of this other stuff. And so for them to really be helping you all the time at the times that you need the help, you know, may end up being very difficult. So, it, it, so that may work out for you, but if you're thinking that that's going to work out, you really want to talk to your children about that because you want to make sure that your expectations and theirs are the same. Um, if you, you're, you're, you believe, as is true in most cases, that you're going to need some additional help, estimate the cost of that care. So you can't pr do this precisely because you're not sure exactly what you're going to need, but you can figure out 24-7 care is, uh, is typically out of the question. 24-7 care by independent caregivers. Uh, typically the cost of care um, uh, in these areas is about $25 an hour or higher. There are 8,760 hours in a year. Uh, at that price, that would cost $219,000 to have home care. That's more than nursing home care, right? On the other hand, for most people, and once again, I'm talking from a lot of experience, for most people, you, don't, you typically won't need a caregiver all the time. You'll need a caregiver at certain times so that you can do certain things. So that when you get up in the morning, somebody can help you get dressed. So that if you're, if you're showering or using the bathtub, somebody can help you with that. Uh, if, you're, if, you're go, if you're having meals prepared, someone can help you prepare the meals. Someone can do the shopping. There are, there are a set of things that need to get done. They're not 24-7 things, right? For, and so for most people, this is kind of a reasonable expectation of what you might need. So estimate that those tasks will take four hours a day. Four hours a day times $25 an hour is 100 times 365 days is $36,500. So assume that that's what you need and figure that you're trying to project out that number for some period of time, I'm using five years, saying to yourself, if, you're, if your health has really deteriorated at the end of those five years, you may actually need to be moving out of that home or you may need nursing home care or you may have died. I mean, just to, to, to be realistic. So estimate that that's the amount that you're going to need. Now, you add up the house of the cost, the, the home repairs, and the cost of the, uh, of the home care, 
$282,500. Remember the assets that Frank and Mary had available. Uh, certainly with their assets, Frank and Mary could probably legitimately say that they could cover costs like that. But the question is, what if you're Frank and Mary and you're saying to, and you're saying to yourself, you know, I could, my worry is not that I'm going to end up dying with too much money. My issue is I may die with not, without, with not enough money. I may have run out of money before I die. So if that's the worry, then the kind of obvious place to go to find those extra assets, if you want to stay in your home, is your home. Uh, in this example, Frank and Mary have no mortgage. The question then is, what are your options in that case? Well, typically you don't want to go out and get yourself a first mortgage at this point because the monthly payments are so high and because they're going to include repayment of principal, which given your age, you know, the mortgage is going to outlive you. It's going to get paid off after you die. So better then to have a mortgage to be borrowing money on your house where you're only paying interest. There are two ways to do that. Uh, one is to get a, uh, a, a HELOC, a home, a home equity line of credit. We're going to talk a little bit about that. The other is to get a reverse mortgage. Uh, there is also, by the way, a tax deferral program that is available uh, in, in every community, but you should talk to your assessors about that, through which you could, you, you, depending on what your income is, and this is not asset-based, what your income is, you may be able to defer your taxes, your real estate taxes, until you die. Effectively, it's the town or the city giving you a reverse mortgage. So a HELOC, home equity line of credit, typically um, these HELOCs are available for up to 75% of the, of the value of the property. So that's the loan to value ratio. On a $400,000 house, that would mean about $300,000. The advantage is they're a low close. The closing costs are typically low, about $1,000. And, and you're, what you're doing is you're basically um, doing a line of credit. You're getting a credit card that is, that is backed up by a mortgage. So like with any credit card, you're not paying any interest unless you're actually borrowing the money. Uh, typically, these lines of credit last for about 10 years, and at the end of that period, you stop being able to borrow and start re being required to pay back that, that line of credit um, together with principal so that, the, the, so that the whole thing will be paid off during typically the next 10 years. The only problem with that is that at that point, when you think, you think, think to yourself, you know, when this is going to start getting paid back, that may be the very point where you're having some um, cash flow issues. So there may be an in, there's going to be an income requirement in order to qualify because you need to be able to show you can make those monthly payments, um, and the and the and this this the uh, the mortgage is going to be due on death or on transfer. The second possibility is a reverse mortgage, which is really the, uh, the same thing as a home equity line of credit. It's a, it's a it's a it's a it's a line of credit that is backed up by a mortgage, a credit card that's backed up by a mortgage. Um, at age, and now in the case of reverse mortgages, you are not required to make monthly payments. The interest simply will accrue. At the end of a month, any interest that would have accrued on the amount that you had borrowed uh, will simply get added to the principal. So the following month, the principal grows a little bit. Um, at, at 70, uh, uh, given current interest, given, and basically you, they, the, uh, the reverse mortgage companies figure out how much they'll lend you by taking the value of your house and by taking the age of the younger of the, if there's a couple, the younger of the two people who is borrowing the money. Uh, at age 70, uh, Frank and Mary, uh, on a $400,000 house, for example, could get about $218,000. Now, the closing costs on these reverse mortgages tend to be high because they build in uh, contributions to a, 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 um, a, a loan insurance fund, which basically covers the cost uh, of folk, for folks who end up not being able to repay their reverse mortgages. Because the thing about a reverse mortgage is, is, is you know, first of all, the, the, once again, the interest simply accrues. Secondly, uh, if there is ever a foreclosure, the only amount that is owed is the, the va it's never more than the value of the house. There is no individual debt to anyone, to you, to your children, or anyone regarding uh, a, uh, a foreclosure. And the, once again, one of the big benefits of these, there are no monthly payments. I'm going to do a Bergeron Briefs uh, um, segment 
this month. Once again, it'll be about 15 minutes long in which I'll interview a reverse mortgage person so we can talk a little bit more about these. Once again, as, as in the case of, your, of the, the home equity line of credit, these are due on sale or due typically a year after your death, although some reverse mortgages are due, before, are due immediately after death or shortly after death. Finally, there is a state program called the Home Loan Modification Program, which will lend you up to $50,000 to deal with issues uh, it, if at that point you're having disability issues, you're having problems getting around the house and stuff. It's zero percent interest. Your maximum income in order to qualify for this program, there is a cap. You can't be making more than $190,000 a year. So most of you who are watching are going to qualify for this. Once again, there are no monthly payments. The, uh, the mortgage is due on uh, sale or uh, death. So uh, that's how to figure out whether you can stay at home. But the question then is, especially when you're in your 70s, you may be starting to think about whether there needs to be a move. Now, not necessarily whether you need to move out of your house, but perhaps, if you're, once again, if you're Frank and Mary, you're thinking, wow, when we get to our 80s, you know, this may not work out. Maybe um, someone will actually move in with us because our goals are to live in our house until we die, uh, we die to be buried in the backyard, to live a happy life, to live a happy life. And by the way, to also avoid not spending a ton of money on uh, nursing home care later on. So I'm, I'm going to flag those, th the relevance of that as I go through the different alternatives for you if you're now Frank and Mary. Um, so what if you can't do all four? What if you just can't stay in your house by yourselves until you die um, and, and also live a happy life? Well, and, and how do you protect your assets in case, you know, despite what your goals, you end up needing nursing home care? So. The first question is, you're Frank and Mary, and Mary Jr. is single and her kids are grown up. Can she move in? Um, a couple of tips. And, and once again, I've dealt with all of these cases. And this is kind of, uh, this is, these are tips based on practical observations. Make room for Mary if she's going to be moving in. Don't think she's going to move in to your standard issue three-bedroom house has got, or, or an older house like a three-bedroom house has got one bathroom. You may want Mary to be taking care of you. You don't want to be sharing the bathroom with Mary. So figure out what adaptations you're going to make. Are you going to need to do a new bathroom? Are you going to need to do an addition to the house? Are you going to need to build a separate house, which is typically not an option uh, in Metro West, but is an option on both islands. Typically the zoning on, on the islands allows for the construction of a second house as long as, uh, as, long as it's small. Make clear what the rules are between you and Mary regarding any payments that you're going to make to Mary or any payments that she's going to make to you. Remember, uh, if she's helping you while she's at home, any assistance she's giving you is presumed to be done out of love and affection, unless it's done pursuant to a written agreement and she's keeping track, uh, that's, that's calculating the hours that she's helping you every day and she's keeping track of all that. Second possibility, you know, if she's, Mary's moving in, is, is you may want to actually give the house to Mary because she's doing this. If that's the case, you may want to put it in your will. Uh, you, you probably don't want to just give her the house. You probably want, if you're giving her something, you want to give her a so-called remainder interest in the house and keep a life estate in the house. The reason for that is you want to make sure that when you die, the so-called tax basis of the house will jump to the date of death value so that when Mary sells it, she can sell it capital gains tax-free. If you give her a remainder interest and keep a life estate, uh, five years after you've done that, that interest that you gave her will no longer be countable or lienable in the event that you later need to qualify for mass health. What about moving in with Mary? Well, there are some very similar considerations. Just like you don't want to move, her to move in with you and be using that same bathroom, you definitely don't want to move in with her and be using that same bathroom. So the question is, what are the adaptations that you need to make to her house uh, in order to be able to live, to be living a happy life, to be living a happy life while at the same time having the security that Mary is there? So now, you, if, you're, if you're adding an addition, you may be saying to Mary, we'll pay for the cost of that addition. Remember that that cost of that addition may be considered a gift for max health purposes if you later need to qualify for mass health. An alternative may be in that situation to actually buy a life estate in Mary's house. That is, buy the right to live there until you die. One year after you've done that purchase of a life estate, 
that purchase is that the money that you've paid is is not is no longer considered to have been a gift uh, if you later need to qualify for Mass Health. You will need to value the house, though, and, and therefore value the uh, life estate. Uh, remember, also, if you're moving in with Mary, to the extent that you're, you're paying her and she's helping you out, that's going to be considered a gift. It's going to be presumed to be a gift. A better way m may be to actually be paying her room and board. Get a calculation from a broker of what room and board would be in that community and pay her that amount. That's not going to be considered a gift. It's going to be considered a legitimate transfer if you later need to qualify for Mass Health. Then, of course, there's a possibility of buying another house um, to simplify. So the goal of the house would be, if you're going to do this, you're trying to shrink down. You're also trying to make it safe. So the new house, make sure that the new house uh, doesn't have the same problems the old house does. Right? Make sure that the washer and dryer are not in the basement because that's one of the places, the most likely places you're going to have an accident is going up and down the stairs with the clothes, right? Um, ideally, um, um, make, uh, try to sh shrink, if, if, if your problem is possibly stairs, shrink from a two-story a two house to a one-story house. Figure out what you're going to need to make that house safe. The mechanism you, use, you can use to do that, you can do a regular first mortgage, but once again, probably you want to consider using a HELOC or a reverse mortgage, which we talked about before. And once again, I'm also going to be doing a 15-minute segment, a Bergeron brief on HELOCs as well as one on reverse mortgages. Uh, you could always rent. You could rent, it at you could rent at senior housing, you could get your own apartment, or you could do assisted living. If you're going to senior housing, remember, there's a waiting list, and those waiting lists are getting longer and longer as more of us are getting old. So check out, if you're thinking about this in the future, you may want to put in your name now. You may want to look at the apartment size on those, in those, um, uh, um, uh, in those, um, se in senior housing, just to see if the space is going to work for you. Remember, when you go to senior housing, uh, if you get in, you're going to be charged a percentage of your income as rent. But if you have other assets, um, they're going to impute interest on those assets uh, at some percentage, and then add that imputed interest to your other income in terms of figuring out what your ultimate rent might be. So if you want, aren't trying to keep the rent low, you may want to be giving away your assets before you get to senior housing. Remember, there's a two-year look-back period regarding those gifts. You may want to move to an apartment. Once again, the question is going to be, is it safe? Do you have the, do, and, and is it going to give you the kind of flexibility that you're going to need? Finally, there's assisted living. Regarding assisted living, what you want to do, don't assume you can't afford assisted living. Shop around to the different assisted living communities, figure out what the prices are, then figure out how those prices compare to where you're living and whether you can afford to pay the subsidy. Look at what you're now paying for your house, for house insurance and cleaning, for utilities and food. It, and, and the, assumption, the assumption that I'm making when I did those numbers for Frank and Mary is that they're, they're spending about $3,200 a month. They're earning $3,000 a month, remember, um, and th which means their subsidy right now is about $200 a month. If they went to assisted living, um, typically that assisted living is going to be costing them about $6,000 a month. Their income is $3,000 a month, so their subsidy is going to go up. They're going to need a subsidy of $3,000 a month. Remember, in the assumption that I made about Frank and Mary and Metro West, their total assets, because at this point they'd sell their house, would be $1,100,000, which means they could afford that assisted living for 366 months or 30 years. You can typically afford assisted living, but the question is, what's your situation? So, uh, we've gone through a lot of material. If you've got any questions on this, please let me know. But remember, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. And it, when you're in your 70s, you're going to sleep a lot better knowing that you figured all of this out. Thank you very much.